Hello my friends, my name is Artur Rey and I am an Estonian YouTuber. There is a Russian uh, sniper called Vasily Saitsev. I've seen a movie about him that's Enemy at the Gates, that's a Hollywood movie and Jude Law plays the damn sniper. Well, it's, yeah, it's a Hollywood movie, so it's very dramatic and really nice, I like it, but of course it's, uh, you know, historically not correct. Who cares? But today we are going to dive into the historical correctness of Vasily Saitsev, the best Russian sniper in World War II. Simple History made a video about him, so we're gonna watch it. And since this is a video about Russia, Soviet Union, I'm wearing Tripoloski, now I will play you a sad tune that sounds a bit Slavic, but it is in Estonian. But as of now, let's just watch who this damn Vasily Sites of Duty is. The sniper's role in warfare is to stay concealed at all times and avoid detection. Then, from long range, eliminate valuable targets or cause disruption using high precision rifles and, if possible, high magnification optics. Snipers also carry out valuable secondary roles, such as gathering intelligence on troop positions. Snipers are a special breed and are highly skilled individuals. They require cunning, patience, and, as well as being a skilled marksman, he or she must be an expert in camouflage. The thing is, like, they talk about, yeah, they shoot at the long distance, everybody knows this about snipers, they wait a long time, then they take there's one shot and then they leave. Um, there's truth in it, but the thing is, You've heard about the White Death from Finland, Simo Haiha, yes, the greatest Finnish sniper and the greatest sniper in the world. He shot all of his shots from iron sight, most of them were not with a scope, so... And the thing is, actually, he was a farmer, he was not trained to be a sniper, he was just a really good shot. And he shot everybody, he shot infantrymen. If, if you fight with the Soviet Union, you have to shoot a lot of people, because they have a lot of manpower, so... What makes his number so big is that he didn't shoot valuable targets, he shot everybody. Simo Hai Hai shot everybody, high and low. Don't matter if you're a sergeant or a, or a private, you'll get the bullet. As much as I know, or at least that with the enemy at the gates, Vasily Saitsev uh, picked his targets, he shot high value targets, usually. Although also machine gunners and infantrymen, privates, but usually he chose the ranks, the higher ranks. So that's the job of the sniper, take out the higher ranks. Or if you're just a sniper providing support, then yeah, you can shoot everybody. The bigger the number, the more they have shot privates and low-ranking personnel. I don't think that you can shoot 500 generals, you know, as Simo Haiga's number is 500. I think Vasily shot more high-ranked personnel survival craft, infiltration, and reconnaissance techniques. By World War II, the sniper had become an essential component, and all the major nations had set up specialist training schools. These schools produced men like Private Bruno Sutkus of the German army, who had achieved 209 confirmed kills by the age of 21, and in 1944 was awarded the Iron Cross first and second class. So 209 confirmed kills are uh, age of 21. I'm guessing that's, again, all of the kills he made. That's a lot of kills. I mean, you're 21 and you have killed over 200 people. You're kind of the devil. You, I mean, if you think about it, to kill over 200 people, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. You have to be a psychopath, kind of, or it's war. But anyway, I think, yeah, they are all just, just kills. There are no high rank targets, so um, I think what makes a sniper great is that he is able to wait on a spot so enemy gets used to that there is no one there they bring out their generals their late lieutenants they lose guard and then the sniper takes a shot taking out one or many high value targets thus weakening the enemy much more than shooting privates because you gotta take out the head of the dragon not like attack its knees or legs you gotta take out the lieutenants generals majors all of that stuff for outstanding bravery and then there was the russian vasily zaitsev born into a peasant family in the rugged snow-capped Ural Mountains in Russia, which marks the divide between Europe and Asia. Zaitsev learned to hunt deer and wolves from an early age with his grandfather. Remarkably, he killed his first wolf at the age of 12 with his single-shot rifle. Age of 12, a single-shot rifle. <laughs> at the age of 12, I was playing Minecraft, I haven't even shot a weapon by that time. Vasily was a tough man. Single shot rifle. You have one shot and the wolf is coming. You have to shoot real good and you're a kid And your grandfather is right there like hey, yeah, I see you can shoot Strilablad. 
Yeah, he's a t one tough dude. They made him quite a hero in the Enemy at the, Enemy at the Gates movie, which is it's a good movie. I suggest you watch it, but watch it with a grain of salt because it's, it's Hollywood, you know. In 1937, at the age of 22, he joined the Soviet Navy. He was made a clerk and posted to the city of Vladivostok near the Chinese border, which was the home port of the Soviet Pacific Fleet. By the time Germany broke the Molotov-Ribbentrop non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union in June 1941, Zaitsev had risen to the rank of chief petty officer. Eager to defend the motherland, he voluntarily transferred to the Red Army as a senior warrant officer in order to be sent to the front line. He was assigned to the 1047th Rifle Regiment of the Tomsk Division. In September 1942, Zaitsev's unit was sent to reinforce the 62nd Army in the besieged city of Stalingrad. There, he very quickly impressed his commanding officer with his exceptional marksmanship and was reassigned as a sniper. Typically, he would work with a spotter, allowing him to take full advantage of having an assistant. Zaitsev used the Russian M1891-30 Mosin-Nagant rifle. <laughs> I remember that rifle from Call of Duty 1, 2, Five, five was World at War. And that's all that they have done about World War II, I think. Yeah, Mosin Nagant was my favorite rifle actually in Call of Duty. I love the iron sight and I love it. A German car, I didn't enjoy that much, as much. We're talking about a computer game here. I have no idea how it feels in real life. I've held it, but it's it's quite heavy and robust. It feels like you can just beat somebody to death with it. It's 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 almost like a wooden club. It's a Russian weapon. I mean, it's a Soviet weapon. Of course, it's a wooden club. But still, it's it's possible to be a sniper with it. I will play you a tune. It's an Estonian song about a cold northerner woman. <laughs> Yeah, about a cold, white, northern woman who is like a snow and it, her heart is like ice. With that being done, we can go on with the video. A sniper version of which was simply a production version that was deemed better made than others, with a simple telescopic sight and melted down bolt added to accommodate it. <laughs> the M1891-30 was a bolt action rifle, famed for its durability and reliability. Yeah, typical Soviet weapon. Very durable, very reliable, looks kind of okay. It's easy to make, it's cheap to make. Can shoot underwater and in sand and in snow anywhere, basically. I know this one can't shoot underwater and in sand and snow. It obviously can't, it jams quite a lot. But if you compare Soviet weaponry to German weaponry, German weaponry, not the last ditch weaponry, but the real German weaponry was really over-engineered, precise, accurate, the best in the world at the time. And Soviets just almost copied everything from them and made it cheap and available. Because Germans actually ran out of material resources to produce weapons, so they had to go with worse weapons by the end of the war. But Soviets copied the design. For example, AK-47 is copied from Germans, obviously. Mr. Kalashnikov based his design on the German, I don't know what it was, MP-44 or something like that. Most of what the Soviets did was copy and paste. It had a five-shot magazine and a range of 900 yards, which its powerful 7.62 millimeter round could cover in roughly one second. The mighty German 6th Army and the 4th Panzer Army had attacked the Russian city of Stalingrad, believing that with its weakened garrison it would fall in a matter of days, allowing them to advance towards the rich oil fields of the Caucasus Mountains. However, the Soviet leader Joseph Stalin had issued Order Number 227, instructing the defenders of Stalingrad that they would take not one step back. 
Therefore, as the With that order, he commanded people to just die. One part is correct that Stalin, the Red Army did not have ammunition and weaponry for all of its, I don't know, 22 million that it went through it at the time of the Second World War. So they didn't have weapons for everybody and some people did go to war without a weapon, like in the movie Enemy at the Gates. Every other one got bullets, other one got the rifle. It wasn't always like that. Most of them still, yeah, they got the rifles. It wasn't like everyone just attacked with the Red Army flag and that's it. No, they got ammunition, but some of them did not get the weapons at the worst part, which is was crossing the Volga. They didn't have ammunition and weaponry back then. They just sent men to the meat grinder. You can't compare any other battle with it. You might think this battle was hard, this battle was hard. No, if you haven't looked into what the Red Army suffered, uh, in Stalingrad, you really don't know how bad battles can be and how much one can sacrifice their own people. It was, just, it was a meat grinder. Germans had tanks, machine guns, heavy guns, rifles, a lot of men in highly defensed positions and the Red Army just sent their men to die, to run dry German ammunition. Germans have to pull back because they ran out of ammunition, not because they were overrun. So they shot all of their bullets into the Red Army. They killed so many people that they ran out of bullets, then they pulled back. That gives you an idea of how many people died in Stalingrad. Within a few months, a quarter of a million Red Army men died just by taking a few blocks in that city. The German tanks and infantry started to push deeper into the city. They were met with increasingly determined and fierce resistance from the Soviet troops. Taking Stalin's order to heart, the city's defenders made the Germans pay for every step of ground as they advanced forward. I remember my history teacher talking about this. In LA there was uh, an old man, he still is, he's 93 by now. He has two bullet wounds, one through the head, one through the leg. He was a veteran, he's a veteran of Stalingrad and also in Yugava, um, the city where I lived before I went to America, there was a one Stalingrad survivor, he's like 95 or something, still walks around. I don't know why they don't die. The thing is, what my history teacher told me that, yes, Stalingrad, Stalin made the order very clear. If you pull back, you will be shot by commissars. Meaning that the Red Army couldn't take one step back, so they fought over every floor. Sometimes there were situations, quite often actually, that the third floor were the Red Army, second floor were Germans, first floor were Red Army again. And this is how it was, they fought over the floors, over the rooms. It was so bloody, the fighting was so bloody, it was urban warfare, which is one of the bloodiest warfare ever. It was all urban, all close quarters and both sides had a lot of manpower to waste. From within bombed out ruined buildings, they used grenades, anti-tank rifles, Molotov cocktails, and of course, snipers to deadly effect. Then an unexpected attack by Soviet reinforcements cut off the attacking Germans, trapping around a quarter million German troops in Stalingrad. However, at first, the Germans did not seem unduly worried and were confident they could defeat what they perceived as an army of poorly trained and ill-equipped peasants. Much to the German surprise, the Soviet troops proved resourceful and exceptionally gifted at fighting savage urban warfare. German officers complained that the Soviets fought like gangsters and did not play fair. Fought like gangsters, did not play fair. How can you play fair if... Your land is being attacked, your families are being murdered, and people are being executed left and right. You want to defend your home. I would not play fair. If you come to my home, take my land, and threaten my family or my country, I would not play fair for sure. If this is a message for, to Russia. If Russia wants to come, then we would not play fair. fair. <laughs> no. Soon, German general Friedrich Paulus requested permission to break out of the city, but Hitler, remaining confident in a German victory, refused. Weeks of fighting quickly turned into months. The battle became a brutal war of attrition with the Red Army, attacking the encircled Germans constantly, day and night. Soviet snipers like Zaitsev started to specifically target German officers, and this tactic soon took a devastating toll on the German Army's morale and command structure. Zaitsev had a number of pioneering tactics that allowed him to become one of the top snipers of World War II. The different Soviet uniforms for summer and winter combat, which were respectively khaki and snow-colored, allowed him to blend in seamlessly into the ruins of Stalingrad, where he would wait patiently for his targets to come into range. Moreover, he effectively used decoys, which would draw the Germans' attention away from his own position. 
In some cases, Zaitsev was known to switch places with the dummy once the Germans had realized it was not real, catching them off guard. Yeah, you see the dummy, I thought about it a lot. You see the dummy, you shoot it, you say, oh, it's not real, obviously. You don't shoot it again, because you know, this is a dummy. And then it, it changes to a real Zaitsev, who can shoot at you and it comes out of nowhere. It's basic basically a game of chess, if you can outmaneuver your enemy. Only deadly. All right, my friends, now we will jump into the Estonian YouTuber Cup competition. Look at this, very magnificent cup. It will boost your immune system, you will never get sick. And today we have a surprise. The maximum number of cups have been ordered by one person. Let's see what it is. Welcome back, my friends. Behind me, you can see the Hall of Fame. Everyone who has ordered an Estonian YouTuber Cup is representing their country or state in the Hall of Fame on the Hall of Fame. We have countries also, right here, Finland is leading. We have one Sean Davis, a city called Kingsland in Georgia. Kingsland, you live in Kingsland, you must be royalty obviously. Well, Georgia gets the point. We have Joe Brummett, the city is called Champagne. Your city is called Kingsland and Champagne. You guys have some weird city names. Really cool, I mean, but it's still weird. The state is Illinois. We have again Jonathan McGeehan. He got the cup two videos ago and now he's again represented. I remember his city. It was Livonia. Livonia was a con not a country, but it was like a, a name for a. a a finno ugric tribe that was very co closely connected to Estonia and Finland. They died out about 200 years ago. The language is dead. We know about the language and music, but it's just not spoken by anyone who lives. You know, it recently died out. Very sad to see our finno ugric brothers go. But still, yeah, you live in Livonia. Livonia is in Michigan. We have David Keller. The city is called Madison, which is just the female name in America, right? I've heard Madison in movies. It's a female name. It's Wisconsin. We have the last order and you will be surprised. Listen to this and learn from it. Ricky Pisa. Yes, Pisa is the weird tower in Italy, the Kureka Tower, but his city is called Cowpens and the state is... Whoa, whoa, hold your horses. It's not just. It's 16 cups. Ricky Pisa has written South Carolina and Cowpens his city into history with 16 cups. South Carolina will get 16 points. What about that? South Carolina had two, now it is 18, which is almost as much as Washington, who has 19, and we have leading. Texas with 27. I don't think anyone's gonna catch up to Texas. Of course the challenge is up to the, for the Sakers. If you want to do it, just go and just beat Texas with your state. But right now Texas is leading. But yeah, South Carolina definitely in the first five now. Back to the video. 16 cups. You wanna do good to your state? Learn from that. Get a lot of cups, your state will win. In order to tell where the German sniper was hiding, Zaitsev would hold up a helmet, which the enemy would shoot through. He would then put a rifle cleaning rod through the bullet hole to determine what direction the shot came from. Furthermore, it was important that Zaitsev killed with his first shot, as otherwise he would give away his own position and waste ammunition, which was scarce in Stalingrad as all Russian supplies had to be shipped across the three kilometer wide Volga River and were vulnerable to aerial bombardment by the Luftwaffe. Yeah, think about it. Germans have aerial support superiority, total aerial superiority. They have better weapons, better equipment, and they're keeping your troops busy all the time that you have to cross the Volga three kilometers wide. It takes quite a few minutes to cross that actually with a boat, and they didn't have fast boats, they crossed, crossed them with whatever they could. So a lot, of, a lot of men are on the bottom of Volga, even right now, not all of them have been retrieved. There's like thousands of men at the bottom of Volga. Yeah, some of them have been reburied, but still it's filled with corpses. The role of the sniper was not just to eliminate enemy targets. Zaitsev was also skilled at intelligence gathering, which he completed using a trench periscope. The information he gathered regarding German booby traps and impending assaults was passed on to infantry soldiers and doubtless saved many Soviet lives. 
Indeed, his constant sniping and intelligence gathering prevented the German army from reaching its full strength and initiating a full-on assault to push the Red Army over the Volga River and out of Stalingrad. The so yeah, the Red Army never was pushed uh, over the Volga River. At the lowest point, which is also featured in the Enemy at the Gates movie, and everybody knows these stories when just uh, Soviets grinded men over the Volga to just be fed into the German war machine. But yeah, they, ha they held about a few square kilometers only at some point, and the rest was Germans. And and the Soviets had to, to hold that few square kilometers. They had to just feed men constantly into the machine gun fire, basically. That's how deadly it was. Soviet General Vasily Chuikov, who commanded the defense of Stalingrad, understood that his men needed inspiration if they were to endure a winter of hard fighting in the appalling conditions of Stalingrad. Zaitsev had an unflinching dedication to the Soviet cause and possessed a humble demeanor. Chuikov felt he was the perfect role model to inspire his hard-pressed troops. Zaitsev was heavily featured in Soviet propaganda, and much effort was put into creating a cult of sniperism around him. The Soviets glamorized the myth of the almost superhuman lone sniper who was completely dedicated to their craft and was exceptionally patient and cunning. Soon Zaitsev was the most famous and revered Red Army sniper of the war. Radio Moscow, which broadcast all across Europe and Asia in 22 languages, spoke constantly of his daily achievements, while the Red Army newspaper hailed him as a model soldier and citizen. Moreover, crudely printed flyers produced in Stalingrad itself spread information of his heroic deeds, which helped in... He's, he's one of those fabricated heroes. Of course he was a hero, he was a really good fighter, but there were many of them in the Red Army, and not... Most of them didn't get the recognition. Red Army fabricated heroes to motivate people. I'm not saying this is wrong. Of course, you need to do this to motivate people. And also, Zaitsev was a really, really skilled sniper. And uh, he deserved it, obviously. But still, he was uh, fabricated in a way that he was a product. He was a product of the Soviet propaganda machine, not a long-standing hero. He was truly a product. Inspire the Soviet soldiers to fight relentlessly to save the city, much like Zaitsev. It was also realized by the Russian command that snipers like Zaitsev were having a tangible effect on the Germans in Stalingrad. As a result, they got him to set up a sniper school within the ruined buildings. At the sniper school, specially selected soldiers were given brief target training in the bombed out Lazar chemical factory in central Stalingrad before being taken on live missions by Zaitsev to complete their training. The sniper school proved highly effective with its graduates killing over 3,000 Germans during the battle for Stalingrad. Oof. They were tasked to kill key enemy personnel like artillery observers, radio operators, and machine gunners. Yeah, high value targets that are not highly ranked, just privates high value targets are communications, artillery, uh, machine gunners, and anti-tank. If you're any of those and you're a private, still you are a high value target and even tanks target you first before I don't know, lieutenants basically, because you prove more dangerous to the cause because you can, if you're a communications guy, you can give information and the re retrieve force can come. And if you're a part of, if you're anti-tank and if the tank comes, the tank has to destroy you first, otherwise you will take out the tank. And tanks are damn expensive compared to anti-tank weaponry, which is very cheap. You can, you can take out a tank with $30, but a tank costs about a million. So compare these. They were also sent on counter sniping missions where they hunted down enemy snipers. Between November 10th to December 17th, 1942, in the frozen wasteland that was Stalingrad, Zaitsev killed 225 enemy soldiers, including 11 German snipers, an average of six kills a day. Soviet propaganda said that the Germans became so frustrated with Zaitsev's success that they had sent their own top sniper. Major Konings, sometimes referred to as Heinz Thornwall, to track him down and eliminate him. The propaganda alleged that after a three-day battle of wits, Zaitsev killed the enemy German sniper with a shot to the head. Konings was either hiding in a burned-out tank, a pillbox, or a sheet of iron. Zaitsev used his glove as a decoy, and when Konings shot it, he figured he was hiding under the iron sheet. Zaitsev fired a shot at the sheet and took out Konings. Despite being repeated in history books and popular movies, the historical accuracy of Zaitsev's duel is doubtful. 
For one, it is unlikely that the German high command would send their most skilled sniper to Stalingrad when they were fighting a bloody war along the vast Eastern Front and North Africa. Secondly, Stalingrad was a large city that stretched for 20 miles along the Volga River, and it's improbable that the two snipers would have been able to find one another for a duel. Finally, no historian has ever been able to prove the existence of a person called Major Koenigs, or a Heinz Thorvald in the German army. In January 1943, Zaitsev was badly injured by an enemy mortar shell and nearly lost his eyesight. Due to his great value to the Soviet military, he was operated on by the pioneering eye surgeon, Dr. Vladimir Filatov. Zaitsev was able to make a full recovery and return to the front lines, training others to become snipers, commanded a mortar platoon, and became a regiment commander. He finished his fighting career at the Battle of Silo Heights, which was popularly known as the Gates of Berlin, as it was just 70 kilometers from the heart of the German capital. Unfortunately, Zaitsev was once again injured during the battle and did not take part in the Soviets' final assault on Berlin. For his sniping achievements, he was awarded the Hero of the Soviet Union Medal, which is equivalent to the British Victoria Cross or the American Medal of Honor. This award entitled him to a pension, priority housing, a 50% rent reduction, medical benefits, and an annual free visit to a sanatorium. You hear about these benefits, right? It might sound funny to you, but in the Soviet Union, everybody was poor. Everybody was poor. Like, no one had anything. You had Everybody had to scratch for food, except for the top 1%, top 0.1% who were really rich. If you got that medal, basically, you weren't poor anymore. You got rent reduction, you got to go to the sanatorium, you, you got all of the allowances that others don't. And in the Soviet Union, life was bad, so if you got these things, you actually got a ticket to the upper class. So this kind of saves your life in a way, so it lifts you up a total class. It was not a class society, but it actually was. You just, if you got that award, you were the higher class. It is thought his tally of kills for the war was around 242, but some historians have suggested it may have been closer to 400. After the war, Zaitsev studied textiles at the university in Kiev. Upon graduating, he found work as an engineer and rose to become a director of a textile factory. He died in 1991 at the age of 76, just 11 days before the Soviet Union was dissolved. Zaitsev was initially laid to rest in Kiev, but in 2006, as per his final wishes, he was reburied in Volgograd, formerly known as Stalingrad, with full military honors. He died 11 days before the Soviet Union dissolved. Well, lucky him, he didn't get to see the thing he was fighting for dissolve. Well, I'm glad it did. It was a horrible empire of evil, as Reagan told us, and he was right. I'm not saying Zaitsev is a bad man, I'm just saying Soviet Union was horrible. But you know what is not horrible? The patrons who keep this channel afloat. We're having an overworldly economy crisis right now. Yes, we have a corona crisis, but also this affects everybody. They can't go to work, so we have an economy crisis. Some people will lose their jobs. In Estonia, we have right now 40,000 unemployed. And Estonia is a small country, so this number is highest. And you can almost compare it to 2008. So it's pretty bad. So I'm very thankful for these three patrons who still support the channel. Dewey Smithy, Mr. Smithy, thank you. Alan Laksa, Mr. Laksa, thank you so much. Diga Thorman, I said Diga, maybe it's Taj, but Diga means like, uh, how do you call it in Estonia? I don't know, if you feel bad, you're angry, you're like very grumpy, then you're Diga in Estonian. So Diga Thorman. Thank you. I've made videos every day for a week now. Kind of like it. Uh, I can do my part entertaining you while you're in quarantine. I think I'll continue doing it if you continue supporting the channel and watching it. So be back tomorrow. As always, until my next video, stay cool my friends and bye bye.